Okay, I skipped a lot of small stories pre-issue 12 because they weren't in the videos I downloaded. So here we go. The short stories start out really short and simple. Sonic Mini Series 0 is a story where Sally's family tree is shown to be chopped down and she cries over it. Which is the equivalent of crying over spilled milk to me. And that's all just one page for one panel. That's disappointing. And there's another page in Sonic Mini Series 0 where we're told why Sonic doesn't destroy his shoes when he runs. It's because Chuck invented them. It's brilliant that they bothered to explain that in the first ever issue. I guarantee you IDW didn't. There's a page in Sonic Mini Series 1 where we see that Sonic can play baseball with himself. Another logical, creative use of super speed for mundane purposes. He can play tennis with himself as well. The fact that they thought of stuff like this, I respect that. I don't buy that Sonic would be speeding off when he's crawling, though, and when he's just learning how to walk. You'd think with the latter two, they'd insist on another picture being taken to put in the album properly. At least Sonic fights into a tree, showing the consequences of him rushing everywhere. We also see him use his super speed in Sonic Mini Series 2, so he can set the timer on a camera and get in the shot before the shutter opens. It's like the writer thought of how he would use super speed and applied that to Sonic. Issue 1's Keep Looking Up. Okay, this is fourth wall breaking, but not necessarily, because in universe, I could imagine that Sonic gets fan mail from his fans in Not Hole. And someone would logically want to know at what speed Sonic's legs looked like spinning wheels. I don't like that Sonic says ultrasonic speed first and then supersonic speed. I feel like that should be the other way around. Not to mention, I don't like even the idea of Sonic being able to move faster than sound when he's not supersonic. It's in the name, people! But yeah, this is pretty brilliant writing because it shows the consequences of Sonic looking at his feet while running through a forest. He'd run into something. And it's not like he could get someone else to do it at the speed he's running. Even if he got a camera to record him, he'd run past his range immediately or a whole bunch of cameras would just record a blur. And even though he saw his feet get blurry at transonic speed, it's not like he has a way to record exactly how fast he was going down to miles per hour. It will forever be a mystery. I prefer to say it's just at sonic speed. That simplifies it a bit. Also, I guess it's better that we don't end the issue showing Sonic in the hospital for a concussion with an ice pack on his head, because then the ending would lose its humor. I think the show consequences enough. The moral of the story is, look where you're running. And it makes perfect sense that someone as reckless as Sonic would make this mistake. It's good to have him be the butt of a joke for a change. Wow, I had a lot to say. Two whole paragraphs for one page. In fast food, there's another story that has the same name as this, by the way. Sonic talks to the audience, telling them how to make chili dogs in the flavor of Sonic. I guess that's supposed to mean the way Sonic likes it, Sonic style, and not flavored with Sonic. I mean, I did see the words Alexien, which would mean in an old-fashioned style in French. Anyways, I really hope this is an actual real recipe, or it'll defeat the whole purpose of the story. And while this is breaking the fourth wall again, I could imagine that in-universe Sonic is talking to a camera that's filming him for his fans in Knothole, who'd naturally want to know how to cook his favorite chili dog recipe. Then Sonic says that the audience might not be happy because this is supposed to be a funny comic book. Yeah, that's fourth wall breaking, I don't really like that. Also, I don't like the supposed to be there. It sounds like something a fanboy would say. Sure, Sonic should have some comedy, but not if they have to force it. It's fine for them to take things seriously every once in a while. It just goes to show the period and time the comic was in back then. Then because there wasn't enough humor in the story, because god forbid we don't have any, Sally shows up with a coconut cream pie and an amusing smile and throws the pie in Sonic's face. It's very interesting to see this side of Sally. We need to see this more often. I mean, she's a perfectionist. She wants to always be good and perfect all the time. So it only makes sense that she'd need to let loose every once in a while with a little mischief, whether it be this, or making Knuckles play her role in a play. I like Sonic's response, well I hope you're satisfied. And Sally says, now that's funny. I didn't laugh, but it was amusing. I smiled. I think the pre-50s issues are the ones with the largest amount of great stories all close together. Only the Betty Lee Golden Age with Tossed in Space comes close. So while I don't respect meta-humor, I like the charm of these early issues a lot. 
In issue 2's All the Males About Tails, there's a story about fans airing their opinions of how Tails earned his two tails. Again, I guess in-universe this is just Sonic and Tails' as fans and not Hole sending in those letters. I just wish they wouldn't mention where the fans come from on Earth when the letters show up, because that only makes it that harder to believe. Anyways, different fans have different opinions about why Tails would have two tails. There's a joke about Charles Dickens and Tails making a pun. I don't see what that would have to do with Tails having two tails. Also, it's kind of hard to imagine that a kid sending in a letter to a Sonic comic would even know about Charles Dickens to that extent. Then someone says that Tails is a mutant. Well, duh. Smartest person in the room, because he's right. Then we see Tails at a carnival freak show, and I like that Tails looks annoyed, both at being there, and at someone yawning at seeing him, which isn't very realistic. I mean, imagine someone yawning at seeing a boy with four arms. Anyways, this is a pretty depressing idea, but also a rather realistic one for Tails' origin story. It would make sense if Sonic met Tails in a freak show, because he was an orphan, and where else would he go? It'd give him a very sympathetic backstory, but alas, forced lightheartedness in Sonic, so instead there's never anything like that as actual consequences to him having two tails. Then we see that maybe Tails was created by Frankenstein in a lab. I don't like the idea of it being Frankenstein, but it would make sense if it was some other scientist in a lab. I really wish we'd got to see alternate versions of Tails in other zones who did have these origin stories for their tails. That feels like something that's just begging to be explained, and it never is. It deserves an explanation as much as where'd all the other echidnas go for Knuckles to be born. I don't get why Tails is hoping his health insurance will cover this though. Cover what? And he's a kid, why would he have health insurance? That's not funny. Another panel says that Tails is Antoine's tail. Great, now I have to look at pictures of Antoine to see if he has a tail normally. He's pretty forgettable after all. Oh, okay, I think he has a small tail, a puffy one? Not easy to see most of the time with what he's wearing, though. And that idea made sense at the time because Tails and Antoine were similar in coloration for no good reason. That's a gruesome idea if you think about it, though. Tails ripping off Antoine's tail to have a second one. We see a panel showing a scientist and a text box mentions evolution, so maybe Tails evolved it. That's the same thing as he's a mutant, though. Mutations over time in a species is evolution. Tails also says that math is hard here, which is pretty weird in retrospect. Though I can't believe that he took a while to get good at it, you don't get born good at math. The story sadly ends without us ever learning how Tails has two tails, which is what puts a damper on the whole story for me and makes it bad because it's a major missed opportunity. I would think the obvious answer was, he's got so much chaos energy in him that it generates a Tails mutation. Basically, he's a Kitsune, and Kitsunis are mutant foxes with magic in them on Mobius. All that would be needed to show this is Robotnik or Rotor holding a chaos energy detector, and when it points to Tails' and tails, it blows up. Instead, we get no attempt at an explanation, and instead, Tails just shows arrogance saying that he deserves his own miniseries, when he doesn't really do anything at this point in the comic. Well, he is really young, and he looks naive and happy saying this rather than confident and smug Ken Pontac Tails, so I can forgive it. The story ends with Sonic looking embarrassed because the fan letter asks him, Why are you always naked? I think the answer would be that clothing norms are different for male Mobians if they have fur. He was just embarrassed because of the word naked. Now for issue 3, Tales and Fairy Tales. With Sonic trying to take a nap on a tree with his eyeballs not always visible for some reason, which is kind of weird since I'd expect Sonic to be a lot more energetic than that, Tails talks about how he read the tortoise and the hare. Sonic's completely dismissive of it, saying, Balderdash! Poppycock! Well, that's an out-of-character line for Sonic to say. I guess he was speaking formally to be ironic. Sonic is completely doubtful that a turtle could beat someone so fast. I guess this story takes place chronologically before Tommy Turtle beat Sonic in a race when they were kids. They certainly look short enough for it. I don't like the ending because there's no way Sonic wouldn't hear a rocket-powered skateboard right in front of him and just continue to yawn and not react at all. It makes sense that the turtle could have that though, maybe Rotor invented it for him. Maybe he bought it from Rotor. That could be how Rotor earns money for his food and rent. He invents stuff and sells it. I really wish we got to see that confirmed. Like, it, it's just annoying how, like, they're all teenagers, and yet they don't need a job to support themselves. 
Then there's a story called Double Speak, where Sonic argues with himself over the phone, speaking very immaturely in an amusing way, like, when were you appointed secretary of the inferior intellect? This reminds me of forums on the internet. Like, he's making fun of Sonic fans before it was cool. They predicted the future. Sonic says that when you travel faster than the speed of sound, you sometimes wind up talking to yourself. Honestly, I feel sad seeing this story. Sonic looks like someone who went insane from loneliness and is talking to himself. Like he's playing around with his super speed, looking like he went nuts. This is how he would act after years of having no one to talk to if everyone in Knothole got roboticized. And again, it defeats the purpose of calling him Sonic and not Super Sonic if he can run faster than sound normally. Oh, Paper Trail, I love the story. I heard about this. Sally acts like a power-hungry princess, saying that she's the ruler of Knothole and her word is law. And she shall be avenged. And she drags Antoine along with her, saying that the investigation begins. It's fascinating to see her like this. She tries to be pure good so often that it only makes sense that she'd slip up and snap every once in a while. And I can imagine that her evil twin Alicia went full on with this kind of behavior, making her evil twin more natural. The punchline is that Sonic and Rotor had pranked her with a newspaper article saying that Sally dyed her hair from blonde to brunette after the Sonic miniseries, calling it a debacle and calling her princess a die. It turns out she couldn't take a joke. It's nice to see her in this bratty princess role. She's more of a flawed, interesting, believable character this way than she was after she matured as a person. Honestly, I might like her more if she was like this the whole comic, but kept having sympathetic and cool moments most of the time. Also, it's weird that the really short backup stories of this issue are between the main stories from now on. Issue 4 is Antoine's vain refrain. It's a really unfunny story that demonstrates part of why I hated early Antoine. He's trying to recite lines from an old play, and the story ends with a pun on vanity, where Antoine, not Rotor, is the one trying to assemble Sally's vanity. I kind of like the idea of Antoine being Sally's servant primarily, like last story where she dragged him along for paper trail, because it shows that he has a, a specific role in the team. But the problem is that he's probably only in that position because he wanted to suck up to Sally to get her to date him. Which feels slimy, because after Bunny started dating him, he stopped with that entirely. Then there's a story called Horizontal Vertical, which is equally worthless because we already knew that the laws of physics were weird in Al Cal's dimension. But there's still no explanation of where they came from and how they can exist properly in a world like that without their bodies falling apart. Because of the weird laws of physics, a thrown ball moves in a weird way, and Vertical misses his swing with the baseball bat. That was unsatisfying. It just waste comic space. Then Badnik's Bazaar tries to have us believe that Robotnik's robots do villain auditions for a chance to fight Sonic again. Why? Wouldn't it be Robotnik who decides to send them against Sonic on a whim? Wouldn't the whole reason he built them in the first place be to send them against Sonic anyways? And what's with the human there? All the Overlanders went to space. I guess she's from the hidden city of the ancients, but nobody in that place even knows about Robotnik right now. And Robotnik doesn't know about that place yet either. I guess she's an android who only looks like a human, or from another dimension. That's confusing retrospect. Then there's hair styling, which at least makes use of the fact that Bunny wants to be Sally's hairdresser, which is usually ignored. Sadly, it turns out that she only has one hairstyle, which is to dip her foot in a puddle and use static electricity that goes from its organic arm to make Sally's hair frizzle up. And this is so stupid. Sally likes it. And Sonic is the only one who realizes how bad it is. So I guess the explanation for the little focus on Bunny's hairstyling is that she's actually really bad at it. And it took forever for her to get good at it, which is why it's out of focus. I guess that makes sense for an action-focused tomboy, but the comic's not very self-aware in having Sally and Bunny not realize how much she failed at her job. And her sucking at it is never mentioned again. So those were the stories in between the main stories of issue 4, and they weren't really good at all. Bad, actually. When they're good, it's fine. They're light-hearted downtime showing the heroes when they're not fighting Eggman, humanizing them. But when they're bad, they just waste precious comic space on nonsense in a failed attempt to make you laugh. Now for issue 5, a fantastic issue by the way. Sonic's 10 second workout. It starts off being pretty pointless because I already knew that Sonic was fast. 
And saying that he can run across the world in four seconds so casually just makes the times when the comic forgets how fast he is later frustrating. Like when Sonic says it'd take hours for him to run to Megalopolis. The story has a great ending, though. Sonic says that if you can't do his workout, you can try Rotor's. Rotor says, I spent eight seconds trying to touch my toes. Ugh. And the rest of the day trying to straighten up. Ha! This is how you make Rotor a comedy relief character. I actually remember giggling when I read about the story on Sonic News Network because of this. Then there's fast food. Again. Where after Sonic shows off with his speed in a mundane situation, which is only natural of him, he makes a mistake that's only natural of him because he was rushing so much that he ate a bowl of wax fruit in his hurry. Again, it's better that we don't have to see Sonic go to the hospital to get his stomach pumped. Even though that would show consequences. Issue 6 Here Comes the Bribe starts with a fan letter saying that the fan wants to see more of Antoine. Since this is early Antoine, Sonic reacts with a complete horror, and we see the letter saying that Antoine's brave and loyal. The joke is that he's not, but ironically he did become that after spending time with the evil twins. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I wish that was explained. But yeah, he becomes so brave and loyal that he sacrifices himself because of it. But right now, it's a lot more subtle. If he had no bravery, he wouldn't even be a freedom fighter. And if he had no loyalty, he would be betraying them constantly and get kicked out. Which would have been a good excuse for him to have character development into a nice person, becoming that naturally, instead of randomly becoming one just because Bunny started dating him. The fan says to compliment Antoine, he puts up with her practical jokes. As we see smoke coming from Antoine that I didn't really notice was smoke at first because it was yellow, and he didn't really have his wig, and oh my god, is that a match? I remember hearing about the fact that Antoine wears a wig because Sonic burned off his hair, but I didn't think he was introducing a side story. That's sick. It goes to show you what a jerk early Archie Sonic was. This is something I'd expect Scourge to do. Not even Fleetway Sonic ever acted like this. But yeah, this is a really good point. Antoine's got the patience of a saint to put up with Sonic's cruel practical jokes like that, instead of him snapping at him and punching him and wanting cruel revenge. The closest he came to doing that was trying to court-martial him in issue 40. And notice that he calmed down after that failed. He even admitted that Sonic doesn't deserve death in issue 46. So at least he gets it all out of his system. And maybe that speaks to what a good person he is at heart that he forgives Sonic and is patient with him. That he didn't go evil from Sonic treating him like this. Anyways, it turns out that, of course, the story reveals that Antoine just bribed the comic fan to say all that stuff complimenting him. Rather than the comic acknowledging the possibility that some fans can like characters that you wouldn't expect them to. Like Fiona, and that's perfectly fine. Huh, Antoine bothered to have a no spitting sign in his room. Did Sonic spit in there? I have a little kid living with me and even he didn't spit in my room as far as I know. What does it say about Sonic? It was a fascinating part of Sonic's character back then. That he was more interesting than just a bland, cookie cutter, nice guy hero because he was me to Antoine. And that's gone now. Now he gets along with all of his friends. He's kind of boring. I'm glad I'm finally getting to experience these side stories, even if I had to go out of my way to find them. There was really a lot of charm in the old Galgar stories that makes me smile. Issue 7, The Shadow Knows, has Sonic boxing with his shadow, with the shadow reacting to it. This doesn't make any sense. This is so stupid. This should have been the result of Robotnik using a device on him, that brought a shadow to life, making it tangible with a force field and having AI from nanobots or something so even could react to being punched. But instead he can do this with no explanation other than he's fast, which doesn't explain why his shadow is reacting to anything. That was bad, it just frustrates me that this potentially good story concept was wasted on a one-shot page. Details are sketchy, it's just about telling the audience how to draw Sonic's face, but thank goodness as an attempt at an in-universe explanation, as Robotnik is trying to sketch what trashed crab meat. Problem is, this still makes no sense. All of the robots should be programmed to know what Sonic looks like, and if they can talk, they should just tell him it was Sonic. you think, all you would have to say is it's a blue hedgehog. And Sonic sure was generous to let crab meat live to talk about his defeat, Normally, he leaves robots in pieces. That wasn't good either. After Sorceress in Distress, the main story, 
We have Princess Cruises, where Sally angrily says no to Antoine's idea to have future naval officers of the kingdom defend the planet with a canoe called the SS Sally. She doesn't explain why she's saying no, so she just looks rude. I can only assume that she explained herself off-screen and is angry at him ignoring her. The heroes have to stay in Knothole to fight Robotnik. They'd expose themselves to danger if they left it to go canoeing. Or they could have their canoe sunk for all they know. And Antoine just named it that to suck up to her. The story was just a waste of time that makes Antoine look like an idiot. Issue 8 actually doesn't have anything I missed, just a brief pit up where Sonic misses a bowling. Fun fact! Issue 9's pseudo-Sonic story, it was originally planned that evil Sonic would appear in his place. I guess, I bet Pander still would have claimed that he made the character though. There's some more pointless pinups that aren't worth showing off there too, like a muscular Sonic and us being told how to draw Sonic. Okay, Issue 10. There was a whole other story that I didn't get to see in it. Sonic eats a chili dog and has a stomach ache when he sleeps, causing him to have a bad dream that makes the whole story after it pointless, but let's see it anyways. Sonic dreams that he's a chili dog who still mostly looks like himself. Sally's dressed like an ice cream cone for no reason, and she says that a pizza delivery guy just dropped off a cooking show tape by Robotnik, where Robotnik wants to kill Tails. Wait, so in this dream, does Robotnik know where Knothole is? Because he sent a guy to deliver something to Sonic's base. He should have he should have delivered a bomb and destroyed it. Sonic rushes to save Tails and slips on a banana peel that he should have been fast enough to dodge and falls onto a conveyor belt where he's gonna get killed by Robotnik. The whole story has stupid food puns for dialogue, but at least it's all justified by being a bad dream. Then Sonic wakes up and complains that he'll never let his appetite get the better of him again. Then when Sally and Tails surprise him with chili dogs for his birthday, there's no actual consequences to his bad dream because he eats them anyways. That wasn't fun. It wasn't terrible. Well, I guess it was, but it wasn't frustrating. I did skim over the adventures of Pirate Sally, but I at least showed off all of its important pages, and I edited the video description to give my thoughts on the story better. Long story short, why would Rosie tell a bedtime story about Tails getting his tail taken off? So that was all the short stories that I missed. They definitely took a downturn in quality over time, but they started out charming. 